Thank you for tuning in to today's webinar, The Evolution of Sex Chromosomes in Asparagus, presented by Alex Harkis. Alex is a National Science Foundation Plant Genome Initiative postdoctoral fellow with Dr. Blake Myers at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center in St. Louis, Missouri. He focuses on comparative genomics and small RNA evolution across land plants. He completed his PhD in plant biology at the University of Georgia, where he focused on sex chromosomes and the evolution of plant sex, among other fascinating topics. Today, Alex will discuss his research in sex chromosomes in asparagus and the ways in which it relates to the evolution of separate X and Y chromosomes, which was published in Nature Communications in the fall of 2017. Without further ado, here's Alex Harkis. Hey, thank you guys so much. And thank you to GeneWiz and GeneWiz Week. It's really a wonderful lineup of genomics heavy speakers that are really illustrating and exemplifying all the incredible things that we're able to do with high throughput plant and animal genomics in modern times. So with that, today I'm going to tell you a story about a seemingly ordinary grocery store vegetable, one that you've likely all seen before. I'm going to tell you a story about how asparagus has evolved a sex chromosome pair, XX and XY, just like humans have over the last two million years to functionally change the way it has sex. This is work that has been ongoing from my PhD with Dr. Jim Liebensmack at the University of Georgia, something I've carried on to my postdoc now with Blake Myers at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center in St. Louis, Missouri. So the overwhelming majority of flowering plant species are hermaphrodites, meaning that within every single flower, there are both male organs, which are the anthers, they produce pollen, the male gamete, and female, flower, female parts, which are the ovaries that contain ovules, they produce fruits and seeds. This is a really wonderful strategy for most flowering plant species in that many times these flowering plants that are hermaphrodites can self-pollinate and you can ensure reproductive success that way. But about 5 to 10 percent of flowering plant species do things a little bit differently. Uh, they exhibit the condition called diese, which is when separate individuals of a species will exclusively produce flowers that are either female, meaning they only have female organs, or exclusively male, they only produce flowers that make pollen. This is a really interesting adaptation that several plants have evolved. Uh, and we see this, um, the conversion of hermaphroditic flowers evolving into dioecious flowers with separate sexes. We find this everywhere across the angiosperm or the flowering plant tree of life. We think this condition of dioece has evolved independently hundreds or probably thousands of independent times. Even though we find f maybe 5 to 10 percent of flowering plant species as exhibiting dioece, we see this represented in more than half of angiosperm families. So it's incredibly widespread and a unique evolutionary adaptation. But what are the genetic controls that can convert a hermaphroditic flower into separate males and separate females? Well, this is a question that's been going back more than 100 years now. You may have heard of geneticists like Nettie Stevens, who originally discovered sex chromosomes, and they did so by looking under the microscope and with deep observational powers. They identified some, sometimes in some species, there is often one chromosome that can be larger or smaller than the others. And we see this, for instance, in humans with a Y chromosome that's very small compared to the rather massive X chromosome. Well, this is one of my favorite figures, actually. This is from Thomas Hunt Morgan, famed geneticist in 1926. He was hand-drawing many of these classic examples of sex chromosome systems where either the X or the Y is distinctly different size than the other. You may recognize a, a couple familiar genera on this slide. Uh, they always tell you when you give a talk to know your audience, uh, you might recognize the humulus genus, uh, that is, beer hops. So next time you're enjoying a wonderfully frothy IPA, you can uh, give credit to the fact that beer hops, humulus lupulus, have XX or XY chromosomes that make them either female or male. So of course your hop cones that flavor your delicious IPAs are all because of an XX chromosome pair that genetically define them as females. But where do sex chromosomes evolve from? Well, they have to come from somewhere, obviously. And the most obvious option is, well, sex chromosomes need to evolve from a regular pair of autosomes. But in order for this to happen, 
there must be some type of inhibition of recombination between what will eventually become a proto-X chromosome and a proto-Y chromosome. And in this region of non-recombination, we expect zero crossover to happen, so that we have regions on the X chromosome that are completely distinct from the Y. They will never cross with each other. In flanking this region of non-recombination are pseudo-autosomal regions that should be freely recombining. But inside of this non-recombining region, something that may occur through inversions or deletions between the X and Y, we would expect to find sex-determining genes, right? So for instance, on a Y chromosome, we would expect to find genes that, for instance, determine maleness. Now there's a really classic hypothesis, and something that even Darwin thought about almost 180 years ago, is that what are the genetic controls on a young Y chromosome that differentiate them from hermaphrodites? And so dating back even to 1950, there's a Danish botanist, Mogens Westergaard, who had a very simple, classic, elegant hypothesis for how a regular pair of autosomes could evolve into a young X and Y system in plants. And that was through two interacting loci on a young Y chromosome. You would need at least one gene that will dominantly suppress femaleness on a young Y chromosome, and it should be perfectly linked to another gene that will promote male formation. So let's think about that. You have to dominantly suppress femaleness, and you have to promote maleness. And if these two interacting factors are linked together in perfect non-recombination on a Y chromosome, and they're also broken or missing from the X, maybe you just need two genes to evolve a young Y chromosome. Maybe you just need two genes to be male. This is a really classic, elegant hypothesis that was formalized into a, what we call a two-gene sex determination hypothesis over the next 70 years. So even in 1970, famous geneticists Deborah and Brian Charlesworth formalized this hypothesis, and it's been under scrutiny ever since. Uh, no one's really been able to show that two genes can control the evolution of a young sex chromosome pair from an autosomal ancestor. Why is that? Why can't we just find two genes if they exist? Well, it's because there are consequences to not recombining between young sex chromosomes. For instance, if you never recombine, you never have crossovers, you begin to accumulate ir irreversibly satellite repeats. Uh, in plants especially, we have long terminal repeat, or LTR retrotransposons, which can be between 5 and 40 kilobases long. They're huge. You often find pseudogenes, you get gene recruitment. So the idea of assembling fully across these difficult, complex, non-recombining regions has been, frankly, quite a beast in the plant biology world to truly understand how sex chromosomes e evolve from autosomes. So today I'm going to tell you a pretty simple question, actually, we're going to go after. How can a sex chromosome evolve from an autosome? It's a question that we've been trying to figure out for more than 120 years. And really the star of this story is a, a species you've all seen before. It's Asparagus officinalis, or garden asparagus. Now developmentally, the wonderful thing about garden asparagus is that uh, we're, we're pretty positive that it's an incredibly young sex chromosome system. When I, for instance, look under the microscope, uh, the X and Y chromosomes are identical cytologically. I can't tell them apart. They don't look really any different at all. Uh, and phylogenetically, we've placed the origin of Dyesi and the evolution of the sex chromosome at really only about 2 million years ago, which in evolutionary time is not very long at all. So very much unlike our human Y chromosome that is incredibly small relative to the X, well, in asparagus, the X and Y almost look the same. And so maybe this is a perfect system for us to get at the earliest changes from an autosome to a young XY pair. So in asparagus, no matter whether you are an XX female or an XY male, all flower buds initiate as hermaphrodites. They have male and female organs in every single bud, at least at the very beginning. But Early on in XY male development, which you can see on the left, and if you're not a, a botanist by any means, uh, these banana-like structures are the anthers, and you can see the female organ at the bottom, this tricarpellate gynesium. Well, early on in XY male development, uh, normally a female styler tube would emerge out of that gynesium down below, but it never does, and you're left with a functionally male flower. 
On the other hand, in XX females, they make anthers until the very last second, right before pollen is about to be produced. This layer called the tapetum, which uh, surrounds and nourishes developing pollen grains, it begins to crush up and crinkle, and it eventually falls off. And what you're left with is a functionally female flower. Well, this really fits with this potential hypothesis that maybe there are just two genes involved in sex determination on a young XY sex chromosome pair. Here in asparagus, we have two temporally separate sterility events. We have a female sterility event in the XY males, where that styler tube does not emerge. And we also have a male sterility event in the XX females, where potentially a male-specific or male-necessary gene is missing from the X chromosome, and that's why the anthers fall off. So maybe this could be true. So let's dig a little bit deeper. Maybe on this young Y chromosome in asparagus, is there the potential of having a single male promoting gene perfectly linked to a female suppressor gene? Could Mogan's Westergaard from 1950 have been right all this time? So the first thing we need to do to really answer this question is to assemble a genome. A really fantastic uh, part of asparagus biology is that we're able to use this genetic trickery called doubled haploidy. Uh, doubled haploidy allows us to take uh, pollen grains from, for instance, an XY male flower, and you can use colchicine to more or less screw up mitosis and turn a haploid pollen grain into a diploid one. And then you can culture it and grow up entire plants. What this means is that we can take uh, gametes that have, for instance, a Y chromosome, double them so they have two Y chromosomes now, and they are perfectly homozygous. So there is zero heterozygosity in any of these individuals. So using one of these doubled haploid YY individuals, which we kind of funny enough call super males, we, at the time, this was maybe 2012, 2011, uh, we sequenced one of these genomes with just about every available technology we could use. This was a collaboration uh, with BGI, the Beijing Genomics Institute, uh, where we used about 120x Illumina sequencing of a variety of short inserts all the way up to 20 and 40 KB mate pairs. When PacBio started becoming more successful, we threw a little bit of 20x coverage of PacBio at this, and some older legacy 454 data, if you can still remember that. And at the time, in 2013, we were able to produce a decent assembly with Soap De Novo. Um, at the time, it was respectable, maybe you know, 25, 30 KB, and 50 uh, of our contigs, um, which nowadays is pretty low. Uh, but that gave us unordered scaffolds, right? Uh, maybe 5,000 pieces or so. Well, another really clever bit that we can use this doubled haploidy feature is to produce an entire mapping population of doubled haploids. So from a single XY male flower, we generated 72 doubled haploid offspring that were all derived from this one single individual. And we were able to low coverage resequence, maybe about 3x coverage Illumina, each of these 72 individuals to call homozygous SNPs and build an ultra-high density 3.2 million SNP genetic map. This allowed us to order and orient more than 85 or so percent of the genome onto chromosomes. So now we have a chromosome uh, scale assembly in asparagus. This was no easy feat. Uh, asparagus is about 1.3 gigabases in genome size. Uh, it's got several polyploid events in its past history, which is complication that all plant genomicists have to deal with. And more than anything, it's 75% uh, LTR retrotransposon. So it's kind of like a thrift store puzzle where 80% of the pieces are identical and a bunch of them are missing. So it's a complicated genome, for sure. But allowing a, or using this doubled haploid strategy really benefited us a lot. So the next obvious question is, well, now you've got a genome. Where is the sex chromosome? And is there a non-recombining region on it? Well. To get at that, we still needed to do a little bit of extra scaffolding on our genome to really improve the quality, increase contiguity. We knew that a non-recombining region of a sex chromosome was going to be complicated uh, to assemble across. So at the time, we, we used a really wonderful uh, take on an old technique, uh, optical mapping. 
uh, using a company, BioNanoGenomics, which has been incredibly successful in a lot of plant genome assemblies. Uh, how BioNano works and how optical mapping in general works is you stretch out ultra-high molecular weight DNA and you linearize it and make it as long as you possibly can. And then you nick that linear DNA with a single-stranded restriction endonuclease and you insert a fluorophore at every nick site. So here you can even see these blue horizontal molecules are actual DNA molecules in asparagus that are huge. And the green dots all spotted along them are wherever there was a uh, restriction nick site. And so what you do is you actually take pictures of individual DNA molecules. And since the DNA is straight at this point, you can estimate the physical nucleotide distance in between each of these nick sites. Well, now that you've got that, you can actually do an assembly using these kind of like barcodes or fingerprints, if you want to think of them that way, and create optical super scaffolds, optical assemblies. And once you have that, since you know the restriction site where each of those fluorophores was inserted, all you have to do is match up your draft genome and those NIC sites onto the optical assembly. What this allows you to do is take your uh, you know, fragmented contig assembly and anchor it onto these huge optical assemblies to span massive gaps that were you know, typically things like LTR retrotransposons or parts of the genome that are just difficult or impossible to assemble, even sometimes with long read technology. So the question we were all chomping at the bit to get at is, now that we've got a scaffolded genome assembly, where is the sex chromosome? Back in you know, the mid-90s, people had figured out a couple genetic markers that were always segregating with sex and asparagus. And when we look at one of those markers and figure out where it is on our new optical maps, scaffolded, PacBio, and Illumina genome assembly, we find that there is a single one megabase region at the end of a chromosome that is entirely missing from the X based on some resequencing data. So here you can see on the top we've got our PacBio and Illumina genome assembly in green and on bottom is the optical map assembly made with BioNano and the lines between show where those assemblies match up, where the NIC sites match up between them. And the optical assembly really helped us to order, orient, and anchor a bunch of our unplaced contigs onto this region of the Y chromosome. So we've got one megabase on the Y that is missing from the X, or presumed entirely missing from the X, and when we annotate the genes inside this one megabase region, I only find 13 gene models, only seven of which look real, to be totally honest. So that's not a lot of area. <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty exciting, actually. There, there's not all that much you know, area to search for. And so the huge question here is, in this one megabase region of 13-ish genes, are any of them sex determination genes? Could this classic hypothesis about just needing two, a male promoter and a female suppressor, could this actually be the case in asparagus? Well, let's go after the female suppressor gene first. We took a reverse genetic approach to identify a putative female suppressor gene if it were to exist. Remember, we're still at the hypothesis stage here. So collaborating deeply with a Dutch breeding company, in particular an asparagus breeding company, Limseeds, which is now renamed as Lim Group, uh, what we did was we gamma irradiated about 40,000 XY male seeds. And gamma irradiation causes random lesions and deletions, even single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, in DNA. And the idea here was if we gamma irradiated male seeds, and we saw any of them that had converted into being a hermaphrodite. It means we have physically blasted out a gene that would be suppressing femaleness, right? So we released that block, and now female organs were able to grow in a plant that used to be a male, or genetically was a male. And then, of course, the it, it sounds so easy. Well, you just find a hermaphrodite, and then you resequence it, and you figure out the gene, and then you write the paper. Uh, it doesn't exactly work out that way, but the exciting thing is that, well, we started to find mutants in the field. The first one we found is that when you knock out that entire one megabase region on a Y chromosome, you actually convert an XY male into a female. In other words, we've turned this Y chromosome into an X. <laughs> and so what this shows us is that, yes, there are sex-determining genes on the Y chromosome that are necessary for being male. 
And without them, if you lose them, you're a female now. And so this is an exciting result that really leads us to think that, okay, we're on the right track. Potentially this could be a two or more gene hypothesis. Well, the next really exciting development happened when uh, Lim Group and some technicians from Lim Group were walking the field and they found a single plant that converted from an XY male seed to a hermaphrodite. And here you can see on the right some pictures of this hermaphroditic flower where you can see the beautiful anthers up top with yellow pollen and then this nice stigmatic surface right down below. These hermaphroditic flowers are viable. They can self-pollinate. They can produce seeds and fruits. So we have physically used gamma rays to convert an XY male into a hermaphrodite. And so, of course, the major question is, well, what gene or set of genes did you blast out? Which ones did you destroy? When I look at resequencing data, just cheap Illumina data uh, of this mutant individual and align it to our reference genome, I find that a single gene, rather a single exon, of one gene had been deleted. And this one gene, hilariously enough, is one of the seven uh, genes in the one megabase non-recombining region of the Y chromosome. We had a total needle in the haystack event. So we knocked out exon two just by total random chance, and we converted an XY male into a hermaphrodite. Uh, the kind of tragic part as a PhD student is that when I tried to figure out what this gene was, had it ever been characterized before, the only hit that came up on BLAST was tragically domain of unknown function. <laughs> so we all thought this was going to be so easy, we were going to find a known female suppressor gene or something like that. But instead we've got a gene that had never been characterized before. So we've renamed this gene suppressor of female function or SOF. So right now we've got one independent mutant uh, with a single gene that we know, or we think we know, is suppressing female organo organogenesis. And if you knock it out, you convert a male into a hermaphrodite. Well, at about the same time, uh, our collaborators in Italy at the CRA, uh, in particular Agostino Falavigna, uh, they called us and said that they had a plant in their greenhouse, an asparagus plant, that was always XY male. It had always produced male flowers until last year when it spontaneously produced hermaphroditic flowers. So we have a spontaneous mutant somehow. Well, when we resequence that individual, there is a single nucleotide deletion in the same exon of that same female suppressor gene that leads to a premature stop codon and a non-functional protein. So total chance occurrence here, but now we have two independently derived male to hermaphrodite mutants that point to the same Y-specific gene as being responsible for female suppression. Uh, and since this time, we've identified several more of these mutants, so we're positive that we've got a single gene that is responsible on the Y chromosome for suppressing female organs. So we know it exists. We, we've at least got one half of the story if this two-gene hypothesis is actually true. Again, we don't really know what this female suppressor gene, SOF, S-O-F-F, does, and you know, we still need to functionally characterize it, but our knockouts are pretty definitive. We know it's suppressing female organogenesis. So the next question is, is there an anther promoting gene on this, on this Y chromosome? You know, we only had 12 gene annotations, minus one now, so 11 gene annotations left. Uh, Using my you know, really expert bioinformatics skills, I did what any skilled computational biologist would do. I took the remaining six genes and I uh, googled them. Uh, sorry, an exhaustive Google search, of course. Uh, and uh, what we find is, <laughs> and this is just my favorite part, one of these remaining six genes is called Defective in Tapetum Development and Function 1 or TDF1. This is a mid-transcription factor. This gene is single copy in asparagus. It's only present on this one megabase region on the Y chromosome, meaning it's entirely missing from females on every chromosome. And so if you remember closely, in asparagus females, they make anthers until the very last second. Right before pollen is about to be produced, the tapetal layer begins to crush up, crinkle, and then the anthers fall off. So this gene, this tapetum-specific gene, has 
a very similar, if not almost identical, knockout phenotype in Arabidopsis, where no pollen is produced, the tapetal layer crushes up, but the pistil, the female organ, is totally unaffected. So we, we felt pretty convinced by this. And some of the other genes, maybe, you know, some of the other remaining five could have male function, but this one seemed like a real smoking gun for us. Uh, about six months ago, in a kind of a continuing collaboration with Lim Group, the Dutch asparagus breeding company, we've since identified an EMS mutant in the TDF1 gene on this Y chromosome that converts an XY male, which you see on the left, which has viable pollen, the little yellow grains, to a neuter. So a single stop codon is now proven to eliminate male function in these plants. So what does this mean? Well, now we know that for the first time in any plant species with a sex chromosome pair, we've identified that two linked genes on the Y chromosome can determine sex in a non-recombining sex determination region. And in the case of asparagus, we've got, as hypothesis would predict, the carpal suppressor gene, which is the soft gene, and an anther-promoting gene, which is the tapetum development and function one gene. The reason I love this story so much is that people back in the, the 50s and even before that, they thought about this hypothesis deeply and without any genomic data, without any sequencing data, they all had great hypotheses and, and really beautiful, elegant ideas, but it took us a long time to actually show it to be true. Well, if we dig even deeper into this question and we start to ask, well, what are the expression patterns? of these two sex-linked genes, these sex determination genes in asparagus. We're really beginning to explore um, more elegant ways to uh, look at spatiotemporal gene expression uh, using single molecule fish in our lab. And this is a really deep collaboration with an expert microscopist, Kun Wong, at the University of Delaware, who's also part of Blake Myers' lab, uh, as well as Jeff Kaplan and Mona Batish, also at University of Delaware. Uh, and single molecule fish is a really beautiful way to uh, quite honestly uh, visualize single molecules or single mRNA molecules of expressed genes and understand and quantify exactly where they're expressed and in what amount. And here you can see an example where uh, we labeled EF1 alpha, a housekeeping gene really, in both a YY super male and an XX female. And you can see these yellow signals are where this EF1 alpha gene is expressed. Well, when we look at the expression patterns of TDF1, the anther-promoting gene, the one that should be specific to the tapetum in developing anthers that surrounds uh, the young pollen grains, well, we see exactly what we would expect in asparagus, that this gene is only expressed in the tapetum as it circles the developing pollen grains, and it's only in males. Because remember, this gene is physically missing from females, so it should not be turned on at all. And that's exactly what we see when we look at the female uh, single molecule fish data for TDF1. There's just no signal. When we look at the soft gene, the carpal suppressor gene, we find it expressed a, a little bit differently. Uh, it's only in developing buds, uh, only in males, but it doesn't quite have such a uh, precise expression pattern. We see it's floating around in several places along a young developing flower bud. So again, this you know, brings more interesting questions as exactly how is this gene uh, functioning and operating. Something really beautiful that you can do with single molecule fish is you can take a z-stack of many layers across an entire asparagus developing flower bud and you can count the number of these individual signals. Each of these yellow dots uh, is an individual mRNA molecule and so you can count uh, physically count the expression of a gene using this method in really 3D almost. And when we do that, when you count the number of expressed mRNAs for both TDF1 and the soft gene in both uh, XX females and YY super males, we see exactly what we would expect, that since these genes are only on the Y chromosome, uh, they only have expression in males and they have no expression in females, so really no expression above background. And again, this is a, a really a deep collaboration, um, particularly with postdoc Kun Wong at the University of Delaware. So, so far, I, we sequenced and assembled the Y chromosome. We had a little bit of resequencing data for the X, which is how we figured out 
that these genes were only on the Y. Uh, but of course, we were only working with a doubled haploid YY individual for the genome sequencing. So a huge question now is, well, what does the X chromosome look like? What is on the X? To do this, we took a little bit more modern sequencing approach. This maybe started about two years ago. Uh, this was, um, we, we basically generated about 40x coverage on the PacBio RS2 uh, with median read lengths greater than 12 KB. This is really the, the brainchild of people like Rod Wing at the University of Arizona who generates some of the most beautiful DNA for plants in the country. And so we generated 40x data. We added a BioNano optical map. We assembled this genome using Falcon, PacBio's assembler. And, you know, it, it cracks me up. It, just with about $15,000 and a single PhD student spending three weeks on it, we generated a genome assembly that was already about 100 times better than the one that cost us a lot more and took a bunch more time. It's really a testament to how quickly genome sequencing and assembly has been advancing. So when we pit these two genomes together against each other, the YY super male, um, which perhaps stupidly, I put the YY individual on the X axis, and I put the XX female genome on the Y axis. Uh, when you line them up syntenically, and this is using a tool uh, from Koji or the comparative genomics uh, platform, uh, you see that they sh obviously share a high degree of syntony, right? They're more or less the same genome, except for that small one megabase non recombining region. And the optical map, again, using bio-nano optical mapping, really helped us out a ton here. So when we look at this one megabase region on the Y chromosome, that's we thought was just missing from the X, and we actually use the XX genome now and put them up against each other, we find something that we would have missed otherwise. There is about 150 kilobases of X-specific sequence, sequence that is only on the X chromosome, and missing from the Y. And again, the, the PAC bio assembly, uh, as you can see on the bottom, really matches up nicely with the bio nano optical maps. And this is really a testament to how, how great PAC bio has become in the last few years, and obviously why it's such a powerhouse sequencing tool. So we have 150 KB of X specific sequence. What are the genes on this X chromosome now? Well, one of them is kind of a, a boring nitrate transporter. It doesn't seem to have any obvious function in female development or anything like that. But the other gene, there's only two genes in this region that I can really identify that are expressed. The, the second gene is really fascinating. It's a zinc finger protein called WIP2 or NTT, which stands for no transmitting tract. In Arabidopsis, uh, this transmitting tract is where a pollen tube will travel down to uh, actually fertilize eggs down below. And if you um, knock out this gene in Arabidopsis, you don't produce seeds. So we think that this gene potentially could have been recruited to the X chromosome over time. It could be a female biased or female beneficial gene. This is also something that's been predicted by these classic sex chromosome models that genes that benefit males will eventually be recruited to the Y chromosome, and genes that benefit females will also move to the X. So really, to put this all into context, for the first time in any flowering plant species, we've been able to show definitively that an autosome can evolve into a separate X and Y sex chromosome by first having a deletion on the X chromosome that inhibits recombination between X and Y. And in our case in asparagus, certainly not in all dioecious plants, just in this case for sure, we know that two genes on the Y chromosome are determining sex. We know that the Y chromosome, since it's not recombining with the X in this one megabase region, is accumulating uh, LTR arbitrary transposons. It's uh, expanding a little bit over time because it can't recombine out these transposons. And we think that the X chromosome might be accumulating female biased genes. Again, as predicted by some of these really classic hypotheses. But what's exciting is that sequencing keeps evolving. And so now, instead of just sequencing uh, a XX female and a YY super male of one species, of garden asparagus, your grocery store variety, well now we have the power to very rapidly and cheaply sequence additional asparagus species. And so we've been going after 
a hermaphroditic species that just has regular autosomes. It does not have a sex chromosome pair uh, since it diversified before the evolution of dioecy. It diversified before the evolution of the sex chromosome in the genus. So using Oxford nanopore sequencing in my own laboratory, generating high quality DNA uh, and sequencing on my MacBook Pro, we've been able to generate about a 15X genome uh, using nanopore long reads in collaboration with Phase Genomics as well, which has their in-lab high C kit, which cost about 500 bucks for us to make a high C library uh, and a little bit more to sequence it. But now we've got a chromosome level assembly for a hermaphroditic species. And what this allows us to do is reconstruct the ancestral autosome uh, before it evolved into an X and a Y. And so we can actually directly test this question of, are genes being recruited to the sex chromosomes over time from other chromosomes? And were these two genes, these two sex determining genes, TDF1 and SOF, were they always close to each other on an autosome? Was this a chance occurrence uh, that these two genes were just near each other and got locked together in non-recombination? Or did they come from elsewhere? So this is ongoing uh, data generation and genome assembly right now. And I'm trying to pioneer a, a new style of data plot. This is what I call the spear plot, uh, that you can see the uh, pretty decent read lengths that we're getting with Oxford nanopore data with about a 13 KB shear. So what this is really allowing us to do is that in the future now we're able to ask how have X and Y sex chromosomes evolved across the entire clade of dioecious asparagus? How do Y chromosomes change over time? Is this a one-way path to a Y chromosome degenerating, for instance? Or do sex chromosomes stabilize over time? So in short, this has been a, an immensely fun project to work on really getting to ask questions that have been around for more than 150 years. Even Darwin himself was puzzled at the idea of why a bisexual hermaphroditic flower would ever switch, would ever convert to being separate males and females. And now we at least know how it happened in one species. So I, I hope the next time you go to the grocery store, the next time you see an asparagus spear, you'll really think uh, and laugh a little bit maybe about this incredible evolutionary journey over the last couple million years that asparagus has been on to change the way that it sexually reproduces. This has been an immensely collaborative project. Uh, this began uh, in my PhD with my advisor, Jim Liebensmack, who's still working on, on this project as well. Um, in particular, uh, our Friends at uh, the Dutch breeding group, Lim Group, were immensely helpful. Uh, this is Ron Vanderholst in particular, John Gronelzik, Pierre Lavrizin, uh, especially our Italian collaborators who identified this spontaneous <laughs> male to hermaphrodite plant in their glasshouse one day, in particular Francesco Mercati, Francesco Sinceri, Agostino Falavigna, and Paolo. Uh, folks at uh, the Beijing Genomics Institute, Phage Genomics, BioNanogenomics, Oxford Nanopore, uh, I'm currently funded by an NSF Plant Genome Postdoctoral Fellowship, which has given me a lot of freedom to explore these questions more deeply. And for the beautiful imaging work that's been done in the past, um, this is all due to a, a postdoctoral fellow, uh, Kun Wong, who works uh, in our lab remotely uh, at the University of Delaware. So with that, I, I would like to say thank you, and uh, I, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Alex. That was really great. We're going to go to Q&A now. We had a couple questions come in. One of them is, what is the future for genome sequencing and assembly in non-model plant species? Yeah, it's a really fun question because even in the last six months, uh, technology is changing so rapidly, uh, especially in plant genomics. Uh, plant genomes are notoriously difficult to both sequence, both you know, to get high quality DNA even is a challenge, uh, but now assembly is becoming easier and easier as we increase the length of reads available to us. Um, I think the future right now is largely in PacBio and Oxford Nanopore long reads for the plant world. Um, they've been the two most successful strategies and reliable strategies, I think. In particular, Oxford Nanopore has been uh, steadily, I think, catching up and everyone's adopting nanopore sequencing in their lab largely because you can get a min-ion sequencer and a two-flow cell starter kit for about $1,000 uh, and immediately begin sequencing in your lab that week. Um, so I 
can only imagine that technology is going to drive even more people uh, into non-model crops, non-model systems, things that had never been sequenced before are now easier and easier to do so. That in collaboration with uh, chromatin technologies, for instance, like dovetail genomics and phase genomics, are able to take even not great genome assemblies, generate a little bit of high C chromatin configuration data, and actually turn your contig genome assembly into pseudomolecules that represent chromosomes. That is completely changing the way we think about syntony or conserved gene order over time. So now with very little money and frankly not all that much expertise, you can generate, for instance, nanopore libraries and sequence data in your lab in just a few days. You don't even need to outsource things anymore. So that's where I think a lot of the, the future of plant genomics is heading. Uh, people sequencing genomes in their own laboratories. Do you expect that this mechanism of two genes determining sex is conserved across other plant species? Yeah, this is probably my favorite question, actually. Um, so sex chromosomes in plants uh, have probably evolved hundreds, maybe thousands of independent times. This is very much unlike what we see in mammals. So for instance, when we look at uh, the human X and Y chromosome, the Y is really, really tiny compared to the X. It's degenerated largely over time. And that's because that Y chromosome and the X chromosome, they evolved about 200 million years ago uh, when mammals first began diversifying. And so they all share, all mammals share a single origin of that sex chromosome pair. That is very much unlike plants. So the the cool part about studying plant sex chromosomes is that you've got hundreds or thousands of independent events of this X and Y or Z and W evolving. And so it really allows us to look at all of the unique and diverse ways that evolution has acted to produce separate sexes. So to answer that question, are you know, we expecting that SOF and TDF1 would determine sex in other dioecious plant sex chromosomes? Probably not. And that's really the cool part about studying plants is that, well, you get to look at every temporal time scale in flowering plant sex chromosomes, from the very young ones like asparagus to the very, very old ones like in persimmon, for instance. Great question. Okay, it looks like in the interest of time, we'll have to stop here today. Once again, I'd like to thank Alex Harkis for his presentation and all the attendees for joining us today. If you'd like to watch this webinar again, the recording will be available at GeniusWeek.com. Also, check out GeniusWeek.com for more activities, including webinars, exclusive promotions, multiple changes to win a $5,000 credit for Genius Services, and much more.